This episode of Industry Focus is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com. Welcome to Industry Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. It's Friday, June 3rd, and we're talking tech and PE ratios. I'm your host, Dylan Lewis, and I'm joined in studio by Motley Fool Premium Analyst, Simon Erickson. Simon, how's it going? Hey, pretty good. Thanks for having me, Dylan. It's great to have you. So, you said before we did the show, this is the first time that you've been on Industry Focus. I believe it is. I find that hard to believe because you are so... <laughs> every time I see you walking around the office, like you're like coming back from like a supernova shoot or you know, you're, like doing some video work here. You're on a couple different uh, premium products, right? That's right. Work on the uh, the Supernova Explorer uh, missions uh, for that service, and then also for the Million Dollar Portfolio. So, really glad to be here. Yeah. And uh, just for your own kind of investing background, you are a very tech-focused guy, right? I mean, that you're kind of that rule breaker mindset that we have here at the Fool. Yeah, and when we say rule breaker, we're looking for innovative companies, companies that are investing themselves to go after the growth for tomorrow. Uh, makes up the majority of our supernova portfolios and a good chunk of the the MDP, the million dollar portfolio as well. Yeah, it's a fun, fun space to follow. Yes, indeed. So today's show, we're going to do a little bit of a rundown on the PE ratio, exactly what it means, what it implies, and how some fools. Simon and a lot of the people he worked with um, use it a little bit differently than most investors. And so, just as a reminder, the PE ratio is our price to earnings ratio. And this measures a company's current share price against how much it actually earns in per share income. So, there's typically two different ways you're going to see this broken down either TTM, which is trailing 12 months. And so, that's looking back at what the company has actually posted in earnings, and then a forward basis. And so, that's taking analyst estimates of earnings expectations and then applying it to the current share price. Um, is there anything, do you put more merit in one or the other, Simon? Well, I mean, I, I, the estimates are just estimates, right? I yeah. mean, this is typically a consensus estimate of what a lot of analysts think the company is going to do in the in the future. Uh, may or may not look like that, uh, but the trailing twelve months is what they actually did do. So, I guess that's the biggest differentiator between past and forward. And if you see a company, or <laughs> if you see a company with a lower forward. PE, it should be right because the company should be growing. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's what you want to be seeing. If it's uh, if it's higher, then the company's not probably doing so great. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, just an example to illustrate how this works. You know, Apple currently trades for just under a hundred dollars. Uh, it has a trailing twelve month earnings of just like nine dollars per share, roughly, and so that gets you to that PE, the trailing PE of almost eleven. Uh, forward PE, it depends on the estimates you use, so you'll see that number fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, but for Apple, most forward PE estimates fall in the 10 to 12 range. And so uh, PE is often cited as this very quick kind of at a glance for companies' valuation, right? It's, it's a number that you can kind of wrap your head around very easily. Uh, but on its own, at least in my opinion, it's kind of meaningless. I don't know what your thoughts are there, but to me, it's all about putting it up against peers or against uh, the broader market itself. Yeah, that's right. It's probably the most common uh, traditional metric for valuation of looking at stocks. It's just okay, what's the PE ratio to kind of give you a, a general feel for how expensive a stock is or how inexpensive. The reason we say that is because it's basically the, the, the price, the numerator is the market cap, is set divided by the uh, the trailing or the forward earnings. And you've got to think of that top one as okay, the market cap is just a function of what the market is willing to pay. In relation to one dollar of, of forward or of, of trailing earnings, so that's why we say expensive or inexpensive. It's basically a higher PE as the company is being rewarded with a higher market cap per dollar of earnings, which is kind of representative of what the market thinks of them. And I largely think of PE as a signal of growth expectations, and that that kind of plays into what investors are willing to pay now. Uh, so, you, like, it's really like what does the com- does, what does the market expect from this company? So, you look at your high PE companies. Market's basically saying. We expect this company to be making a lot more money in the future, and we're willing to pay up for it now to enjoy that ride, that share price appreciation that comes along with it. Uh, low PE companies, the market saying, eh, we don't really expect a ton of growth from your business. We don't expect it to outpace your competitors or the broader market. Uh, and I think actually right now Apple's kind of a good example of that. You know, you look at them; they're on a trailing basis, like I said, around 10 or 11. Uh, the broader market is in the low 20s, and you look at some of their competitors like Microsoft; they're actually up in like the Low 40s right now, so um, that disconnect in valuation is the market signaling we don't expect Apple's growth to outpace the broader market's growth, right? Yeah, and great point you pointed out about what what point of the life cycle of this company are we in right now? Are we are we a super fast growing early stage company that should be plowing most of its money into the company itself to grow faster, or are we an established company that's been around for decades that everybody's using their products and it's pretty stable growth? 
not remarkable growth, but you want to be paying out more of those earnings in tr- forms of dividends or stock buybacks, rather than plowing them right back into the business for, to go out for more growth. Yeah, and the idea there is, if you're reinvesting it in yourself, the ability to grow the business and the growth rates that you'll achieve by investing that money in is better than what you'd be uh, giving shareholders via a dividend. Exactly. Right? So, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring on the show is uh, the rule breaker way and, and some of the ways that our premium analysts think about PE is quite a bit different than how a lot of people think about PE. So, you know, you'll read articles and they'll say, oh, you know, this company has a PE of 40 and they're really over, they're just overpriced. They're way, very expensive right now. Uh, that, that's not really the way that you guys think about it, right? Yeah, that's right. It, it a lot of it is a function of, of where the company is, but also where the market is too. You know, if you've got a mature market, you would expect a, maybe a higher earnings out of the company right now. It's more mature, but if it's a new, fast-growing market, maybe you're willing to pay more for for future growth out of that company. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, some investors will kind of categorically rule out these high PE companies. You know, they're not interested in paying up for speculative growth, they're going to take your stable, low P.E. dividend payers, people that are buying back tons of shares, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to reference an old Fool.com article here. It's one from 2006. And the headline is, uh, The Highest Possible Returns, period. And this is something David Gardner wrote a little while back. But he lays out his methodology for stock selection. And I think this really great note here that kind of hammers home how some people here at The Fool think about P.E.s and just general valuation is, Sign number six, and I think this is a, maybe a seven-step kind of approach for looking at rule breaker or a company this, that will outperform. Um, you must find documented proof that it is overvalued according to the financial media. And, and the quote that he writes here is: "If a company is growing its earnings and as a result has an increasing valuation, there will be someone somewhere who will argue that the company is overvalued. The reason uh, the reason this is valuable is that it keeps people out of a stock." Later on, as a company proves out its position and is profitable, even dominant later uh, as a market leader, then the skeptics will finally buy in. And so, uh, it seems like that's kind of the approach internally, and that's the mindset with which you're looking at some of these companies that maybe a lot of people are overlooking. That's exactly right. Um, so, as you point out, we, we do have six signs of a rule breaker. This is kind of our philosophy for investing in growth, and this is the, the final sign. Sign six is that it is overvalued. As you pointed out, Dylan, a lot of investors, um, which this is not a bad thing, but just will not invest in, in higher PE companies. They want something more stable. They want to buy tobacco companies or Coca Cola kind of companies. They just have that steady recurring, you know, dividend stream you can count on. And if you're in enti- you're in retirement, there's nothing wrong with that. You want that steady income coming through. But growth investing doesn't do that. We, we really are looking for companies that are taking that stream of, of gross profit and then operating profit, which is after you pay back your R&D, your operational costs, and you're reinvesting that right back into the business. Um, we want companies that are going after the growth tomorrow. And there's a lot more uncertainty from that, too, right? You don't know if it's going to work. And so, you have to look at softer factors, like what does the management of team look like? What is the vision of the CEO of this company? What is the board of directors comprised of? And those are things that are not as quantitative that you can just look at in ratios and really discern out of a PE ratio. But there's a lot of companies that that stuff really matters for stock returns. We're going to talk about a couple of those later on the show here. Yeah, I think one of the other points to bring up with very high PE companies is they tend to be uh, they tend to be in nascent markets, so it's it's one that is much harder to predict the total value of that business and the market share that they're going to be able to realize, and just the value of that addressable market. Uh, and even if you do have a perfect understanding of that, because it's nascent, a lot of people just don't understand it. You know, it, it's hard to see exactly where it's going to be five or ten years from now. Whereas your big tobacco companies, your soda companies, things like that, people have a general sense of what demand's going to look like and what the big picture is for them, right? Absolutely. I mean, look at look at Facebook as a perfect example of that. A couple of years ago, Mark Zuckerberg says he's going to be paying two billion dollars in an acquisition of Oculus for virtual reality. And I remember seeing a lot of headlines that were laughing at this move. Right? What is he thinking? Virtual reality? We've been talking about that for three decades. No one's ever done anything with this. And now we went to the South by Southwest conference uh, earlier this year, right, Dylan? It was a blast. And, and what was one of the biggest topics at the South by Southwest conference? Virtual reality. I mean, it's amazing. I've just in a couple of years, this has gone from what are we thinking to this is a really big deal that everyone's getting excited about and behind. And and that just shows you when you're when you're early on in developing a new market and you're a visionary leader, um, you can gain a lot of reward in a lot of places that other companies are not looking at. Mm-hmm. So, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about a couple examples from the past, uh, from the Rule Breaker and Fool universe, of some high PE companies that have kept soaring 
And we're also going to take a look at one that Simon currently has his eye on right now. This episode of Industry Focus is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. If you ever bought a home, then you already know how frustrating and time-consuming getting a mortgage can be. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century by taking out all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for a mortgage out of the equation. With Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button, helping you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. Even better, with Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this on your phone or tablet. So, if you're looking to refinance your mortgage or buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. So, Simon, this being the tech show, you know, we cover an industry with a lot of high flying PEs. Uh, I thought it would be really awesome to talk about a couple companies in the space uh, that have illustrated some of the merits of this approach, looking at these high PE companies uh, that have done pretty well for investors, and then maybe talk about one that you're particularly excited about now that Great. is maybe a little bit under the radar. Um, and I, I wanted to bring you on the show because I know you focus on tech, and I think that the space is particularly prime for this type of investing approach. You have a couple of reasons for that. Sure. Yeah. There's, so again, when we're talking about the E and the PE ratio, this doesn't account for a lot of things that a lot of tech companies um, are plowing back into the business, which is decreasing the E, which is inflating the PE ratio. If I haven't confused everyone with that analogy, there. <laughs> there's a lot of rhyming <laughs> letters going on there. Yeah. But, but it's companies that are investing more in themselves. Um, the first reason for that is is really kind of cloud based computing. Um, companies are spending very heavily on servers and a lot of uh, IT infrastructure for hosting things in the cloud. And more and more software is moving in this way. But when you spend a lot of money up front on those servers and infrastructure, you have to depreciate that over time. And depreciation reduces your earnings over time, too, so you have less reported earnings in the, in the short term, uh, but a huge benefit over the longer term. And then the second thing we've really seen in the, in the tech industry also is there's, there's kind of a favor of... Um, or a preference of paying employees, especially developers, in stock. And stock-based compensation uh, is an expense that's not a cash expense. So a lot of these companies are still producing a lot of cash flow, but it does uh, work against your earnings too. So companies that pay money or uh, uh, pay their employees in stock rather than cash, that tends to be a lower PE, or I'm sorry, a higher PE, lower earnings company that's still pulling in a lot of cash from the licenses. So two things that really particularly uh, pertain to the tech industry for this. Gotcha. Okay, so let's look at a few examples here. Two from the past that you wanted to highlight: Amazon, a fool favorite, and Salesforce. Uh, so why don't we start out with Amazon? Not a company that was profitable when David Gardner originally recommended it back in I think it was 2002. Um, their top line's grown like 25x <laughs> since then, which is incredible. Uh, it seems like it's moving towards constant profitability. Uh, what do you have to say there? And what's the PE today of, of Amazon? Do we have that number? Oh, it's in the hundreds. Okay, it's it's still in the hundreds, even though the company's been around for for more than 20 years now. It, Jeff Bezos Premium, right? This is a company that at first I, I think didn't get a lot of attention because they thought they were just spending too much money on the infrastructure to build out this new e-commerce thing. But then when you start seeing them gaining share and people keep coming back and back to Amazon over time, um, that's a different story today. And you know, Amazon is still, after you said, 25x increase in revenue, trading at astronomical PEs. But no one's looking as much as that at that PE ratio because there is a lot of faith in Jeff Bezos and the future of Amazon. So one one example right there. Yeah, and so Salesforce actually really not all that different. Um, they weren't profitable when they were originally picked, uh, and despite a massive run up over the past couple of years, they're still not profitable. Um, and you know, I think. You're seeing them realize market share and a lot of the big expectations that are built into the stock, but it seems like the valuations for both these companies suggest there's a huge runway in front of them. That's right. And when we say not profitable, we should we should specify this is not gap earnings profitable. Correct, Reporting right. a, a negative net income, uh, even though Salesforce for years has had positive operating cash flow, which is something else we look at a lot in Rule Breakers and Supernova. Of, you know, if you're paying out um, stock based comp, if you're depreciating the equipment, those are non cash charges. So we also look at the operating cash flow of how much is actually going into the company's bank to pay for things like servers or infrastructure and stuff like that. And they've been very profitable by that metric for a number of years. Um, also, a, a very visionary company, I would argue, with Salesforce. Uh, they've, they've kind of redefined software, especially customer relationship management, which is their kind of specialty, in putting it into the cloud. It's no longer going site by site and selling bulky software uh, to companies. It is centrally hosted over the cloud, and that 
requires a lot of investment up front, but it's also a lot easier for the companies that you're selling to. And it's gotten them a lot of wins over several decades now. Yeah. So, uh, PE can be kind of difficult for some of these companies, particularly ones that don't have any gap income to report, right? And you talked about some other metrics uh, that you can look to for success. Um, what do you think about price to sales for these companies? It's a good one for tech, but it's early on. Again, you wouldn't expect um, there are very few companies in the tech industry that, right when they are um, incorporated, are immediately profitable. It just doesn't happen. They're, they're plowing into the business for the reasons that we've talked about. But it may be a more appropriate metric for companies like that that aren't profitable is the price to sales metric. You can see the, the growth of the company at the top line, and then how valuable is that to investors when you're when you're looking at the market. Yeah, at least with that, you kind of have something to hang your hat on. Whereas like a negative PE ratio, you're just like. Uh, you don't you don't know what to do with it, right? Exactly. Um, all right. So last one you wanted to hit on here, Viva Systems, um, and this is something you're really interested in now. I yeah, I know they're in the cloud space. What exactly do they do? Sure. So Viva Systems, um, to start with, with why this company exists. This was founded by a gentleman named Peter Gassner. Came from Salesforce.com. He was the vice president of technology at Salesforce. He built out all of that back-end architecture that no one knows what's going on back there for Salesforce. All the servers, all the infrastructure, all of that stuff that, that keeps that software running. He designed it and he built it. And then he made an agreement with Salesforce um, that he was going to go after customers in the life sciences market. So, healthcare companies, pharmaceutical companies, companies that are selling drugs to hospitals. And the reason that's interesting is because traditional sales, traditional customer relationship management, is you want to be more efficient with your sales force. Before I was an investor, I was actually a sales guy myself. Okay. We would go out, we would do calls, we would write up a call report, we would distribute that to the company, and then we'd try to make sense of, of what was going on out there. CRM software allows you to immediately in the cloud, throw that all up there, see where your wins are, see where your profit margins are, and see what customers you should go after. And Gassner said, hey, there's a great opportunity for this in life sciences, too. You want to see what drugs are hitting well, which are your blockbusters, where should you be directing your, your sales force? And so, we brought CRM to this life, life sciences industry, and that's what Viva Systems is doing. On top of that, um, they're also now working with pharmaceutical development. So, the R&D part of that is also very important if you're a pharmaceutical company. You want to develop drugs more efficiently, get through these FDA trials more quickly, and that can reduce your cost so that when you do commercialize a drug, you get a better bang for your buck. So, that's what Viva Systems does in a nutshell. So, this is something that we saw quite a bit of when we were both at South by Southwest, but uh, these tech companies, traditionally tech companies, or what they do being more in the tech space, kind of creeping into these other industries. And I think this is a perfect example of something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And life sciences is more and more data driven. You're seeing, like, like you talked about South by Southwest, there's more and more decisions being made based off of data rather than just, oh, I've got a hunch, or oh, hey, this is what the past has told me. And a lot of that is because you're able to see into the human genome now. You're able to see DNA level data that can direct decisions and actually improve outcomes, which is quite fascinating that you're improving uh, patients' lives from all of this, too. So, really hot space right now. And still a very nascent one, right? And as the PE suggests, like, you know, it kind of backs it up. Uh, I think they're currently in the 80s. So, that certainly fits the bill for pricey companies. Which you look at that, if, if I can jump in on that, too. Yeah. And, you know, traditionally, it's been CRM software like we were talking about. But Vault, Viva Vault, Viva Vault is now addressing that, that R&D side of the equation. And they also just said, hey, we're applying this for a highly regulated market that is life sciences. Why don't we expand our reach to outside of life sciences, too? On the last conference call, we said, Gassner said, hey, we're going to expand outside of life sciences. There's a lot of regulated industries that want to be more efficient. Viva Software proved that it works for pharmaceutical companies. Let's see where that would catch on somewhere else. And you've seen this, the stock price of Viva jump about, from, from the chart I'm looking at, about 75% since February. Because you can start seeing them unlocking value in those nascent markets, like you, like you mentioned, huge opportunities. PE is still skyrocketing high, but the market is understanding the value of what this business is bringing. Yeah, and that's really where a lot of these astronomical PEs come in. You have companies in spaces that maybe don't even exist, right? You know, a lot of the stuff that Amazon is currently doing, a lot of people probably wouldn't have conceived of five years ago. You yeah. know, um, you look at what they kind of unveiled with their web services division and how incredibly profitable it is for them. And that wasn't something people really had a sense of until they started disclosing the financials there. So, um, part of the reason you see these high PEs is just, uh, you know, people don't exactly know where a business is going or what's under the hood sometimes. Yeah, perfect example. Like you just said, businesses learn what they're good at over time and can expand their market. I mean, another one I'll bring up is Uber, private company, not traded on the stock market, unfortunately, uh, for, for publicly 
uh, facing companies or publicly traded companies rather. But this is a company that started as, as a ride sharing app in New York City, right? Black cars in New York City would pick you up and they realized that they were an app company, not a car company. And they started expanding that. They said, hey, why don't we open this to, to more cities? Why don't we expand this to logistics and transportation rather than just ride sharing and stuff like this? And now Uber is, you know, <laughs> several tens of billions of dollars of, of cap market capitalization right now. But it's a company that learned where its niche was, learned what it's good at, and then expanded those markets. And a lot of that you'll see always at a high PE ratio and definitely a rule breaker kind of company. Yeah, if you're thinking about a company in what they're currently doing, the PE ratio if it's high, is never going to make sense. Exactly. Right. It's much more about what they could be doing, and that that's kind of what you have to pay attention to. And so, if you see that the things that management is talking about, or the opportunities that are available to a company in that kind of space, can justify those types of valuations, then it might be a company worth looking into. You know, I, th- I think that's generally the way to think about some of these high PE tech companies. Absolutely. Anything else, Simon? No, that's it. You know, check out our Rule Breakers website if you want to learn more about kind of high PE, growthy kind of companies. We do have the six signs of a Rule Breaker. Uh, you mentioned one of them that it's kind of historically overvalued in the media, uh, but you want to find the right companies to do that too. You don't want to just go out and say, "Hey, I'm going to buy every high PE ratio company out there." The uh, the devil's in the details of that. You have to really say, "Well, why is the PE high on this?" What is the future going to look like for this company? And we kind of try to spend a lot of our time identifying those competitive advantages and why is this company different than anything else that's unprofitable out there. So that's a trick of rule breaker investing. And to your point earlier, these high growth companies, the high PE companies, they're not necessarily for everyone. Depending on where you are in your investing life, like it might not make as much sense, but it's just something to think about. Consider for your own portfolio. That's right. Well, listeners, that does it for this episode of Industry Focus. If you have any questions or just want to reach out and say, hey, shoot us an email at industryfocus at pool.com or tweet us at MF Industry Focus. If you're looking for more of our stuff, subscribe on iTunes or check out the Fool's family of shows at fool.com slash podcasts. As always, people on the program may own companies discussed on the show, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against stocks mentioned, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear. For Simon Erickson, I'm Dylan Lewis. Thanks for listening, and Fool on!